I was going to be in Durham at the same time that he was going to be available to do a call. And that date that we agreed on was September 5th, 2001. In one particular exchange, Peterson posed as if his sexual past. Peterson looked very comfortable in his emails with him. He mentioned having sex with an NC State cross player at some point. So I'm guessing he'd been doing this all his life. Despite Michael and Brent's planning, their liaison never came to be. I bailed on him. I bailed on Michael on the night of September 5th. And honestly, the last thing I wanted to do was work at the time. I was just a lazy son of a bitch and I decided, you know what, I really don't want to do this call tonight. Well, these two men never meet. The prosecution says that these sordid emails reveal a hidden life by Michael Peterson. He's not who he seems to be. It was humiliating to know not only had Pat Lane been beaten to death. Oh, yeah, you're getting up and going to work. Well, what's Michael doing? Money's tight, Christmas is coming, and he's dialing up male prostitutes. It broke my heart. David Rudolph then rises to question Brent and directs his attention to another topic in the emails he exchanged with Michael Peterson. He did bring up Kathleen in our emails together. He told me how much he had a great relationship with his wife and this is just a part of his life and she gets it and it's just something that they don't talk about, which actually I can't believe because there were plenty of other clients I had who were married and their wives knew that they were at maybe going to see me on a particular night. The fact that there's an email written by Michael Peterson saying, I am happily married, is really good for the defense. It shows that he really doesn't want to do anything to harm the marriage. He just wants sex. And why is he going to kill her? Why, why would he kill this dynamite woman he didn't want to do anything to harm the relationship with? But Kathleen's sister, Candace, disagrees. There was no arrangement between Kathleen and Michael. You can call it bisexual, you can call it gay. I find it just flat out adultery. So, no, my sister was not staying in marriage where there was infidelity at all. The reason that her first marriage broke up was because of an extramarital affair. And we believed all along that this was the, the triggering mechanism for that conflict that he Brent leaves the stand, and the prosecution turns to the most critical evidence uncovered at the Peterson home. At the crux of this case is the blood. The blood makes the case. The blood that was in the stairwell, it was on walls, it was on a couple of steps, it was on the rising of the steps. There was a lot of blood there. The big question is, how did it get where it got? Did it get there because she had an accidental fall or two? Or did it get there because she was beaten to death? To prove that the blood spot was the result of a homicidal beating, the prosecution calls a key witness. Wayne Beaver was an expert in blood spatter that we call from the State Bureau of Investigation. Under questioning from Jim Harden, Deaver explains that he went to great lengths to understand the blood spatter found in the Peterson stairway. Wayne Deaver, myself, and members of my team went to the FBI lab in Raleigh, and we did experiments. We built a small box that would be compared to the stairwell. What causes the blood spatter evidence? It's a source of blood being struck. The source of blood is the back of her head, which has already begun to be bloody. And we took a mannequin head, put a wig on it, and poured a piece of blood all over the wig. And we struck it many, many times with the one object just to see if the blood spattering would be comparative to what we found in the stairwell of the home. Now, the extrapolation is that she was standing and someone was striking her with some sort of object on her head. And when they pulled the object back to hit her again, the blood cast off and landed on the wall in a downward fashion. That's why it's so high up on the wall. Deaver then explains that the resulting blood spatter was not limited to the stairway walls. Clothes that Michael was wearing at the time, he had on a pair of shorts, and what appeared to be a jersey type top. There was blood smears all over his shorts. There were also 
dry blood spatterings on the inside the legs of Michael Peterson's clothing. Peter, explain that he had done experiments and those experiments proved to him that Michael Peterson had to have been standing over his wife, beating her, and the blood splattered back up on him. That, to me, is the most damning evidence, because there's no way that that could have happened except for him being above or causing the blood spatter. According to Deaver, there are additional pieces of evidence collected at the scene that support this theory. When I first observed Michael Peterson running through the house, he didn't have shoes. When I collected his shoes, the bottom of his shoes were blood. And all that was sent to the SBI lab. At the crime scene, the police had found a partial shoe print on the back of Kathleen's sweatpants. When investigators later tested that footprint, it matched the sneakers that Michael Peterson had been wearing that night. It's clear that at some point, he's attempting to keep her down while he's administering some aspect of this beating to him. Now it's David Rudolph's turn to cross-examine Dwayne Deaver. He begins by attacking the blood specialist's methods. Rudolph goes through a litany of questions, challenging the scientific experiments that Deaver did. Like, how much blood did you put in those sponges? You're trying to replicate blood in the head. He's asking questions Deaver really didn't have an answer to. I think it dropped Mannequin's head from the ladder. Like, nobody suggested that she was dropped from the ladder straight on her head. So why would you even do that? It's like he's doing things over and over again, almost as though he's waiting to get the right result. It was laughable. Junk science, in the words of the defense attorney. Rudolph then questions Deaver about an article of Michael's clothing that received little scrutiny. Michael had been wearing a really dark shirt, and there was no obvious blood stains on it. And you know, the question was, if he'd been attacking her, one would expect a certain blood stains. He said, why didn't you test his shirt? And Deaver answers, well, it was a dark color, navy blue, and you can't see blood with your naked eye on such a dark color. And Rudolph followed up, he said, well, there are several tests you can do. Did you do, for example, a Luma test, a specific light they show you? And Deaver ultimately admits he did do such a test. Rudolph is stunned. When Deaver mentions doing a light test on the dark shirt, this is the first time Rudolph hears about it. That's never been mentioned in any of the reports that he has. So immediately he asks, well, did you do a report about it? Yes. Well, where is it? I gave it to the prosecutors. Prosecutors? Don't know where the report is. They've never seen it. Defense attorney Rudolph is genuinely shocked at this news. He says, well, what was the result? Well, he said, I didn't find any blood spatter. Now, it stands to reason if Michael Peterson was standing over his wife and beating her, that in addition to the blood on his shorts, there would be blood on his shirt, too. Deaver didn't have an answer for it. And not having an answer always makes you look bad. While the line of questioning is beneficial to Rudolph's argument, the omission of the test from the court record opens a massive window for the defense. Rudolph is entitled to any reports that Deaver's done before he testifies. So this is what's called a discovery violation. There's a range of sanctions for a discovery violation. The ultimate sanction being striking the witness's testimony. If the judge strikes Dwayne Deaver's testimony, the prosecution's case is gonna fall apart. Do you know where your passport is right now? Well, dig it up and giddy up because the City Advantage Platinum Select Card is here to get your head in the clouds and your feet on new ground. It's time to meet strangers who become instant friends. <laughs> Distant relatives that you can hold close. And you, yeah, you. Did you find that passport? Oh, it's on. Oh, uh, look, sir. So take a deep breath and get swept off your feet. Because this moment is finally yours. Maybe not as long, but this moment. There's so much more to see, so much. And this is your ticket.
Spread your wings and shake that tail feather. Gather your advantage miles because making a splash is on. Going offline is on. Doing whatever this is is on. And every swipe gets you closer. Travel on. City advantage. Over a month into the Michael Peterson trial, State blood spatter expert Dwayne Deaver stands accused of mishandling key evidence. Deaver admitted that he tested the shirt of Michael Peterson and found no blood spatter, but the defense never got that report. And that prompted the defense to submit a motion to dismiss all of Deaver's testimony from the trial. The judge ultimately decides that this was just an honest mistake. And Deaver's testimony stands. With the blood analysis behind them, the prosecution calls state medical examiner, Dr. Deborah Radish. She testifies to Kathleen Peterson's toxicology report, which shows traces of value and alcohol. Her blood alcohol was uh, zero point seven. With that blood alcohol, she has not met the threshold for impaired driving in this state. She was not intoxicated. She was not stumbling drunk as Mr. Peterson attempted to deploy. Radish then details Kathleen's extensive injuries. They're most consistent with the types of injuries you would see in attempting to fend off an attack. I think it would be unlikely to occur as a result of a fall. Dr. Radish also testified that in Kathleen's clenched hands, there were several strands of hair. DNA tests later determined that those were her own hairs. Now that's not that unusual with victims of an assault. Prosecutors believe that it's possible while Michael was attacking his wife, she was clutching her head for protection. Harden then questions Radish about her conclusions. In my opinion, the manner of death in this case is homicide. Now it's David Rudolph's turn to get up and cross-examine Deborah Radish. He immediately begins to pull holes in the prosecution's theory about what happened. If there was a fight at Hanger involved and, and Michael started attacking Kathleen with an intent to kill her, you would expect there to have been more damage, skull fractures, things of that nature. And the warning. Defense attorney David Rudolph pulls out a dozen binders full of case descriptions, 257 fatal beatings in the last decade in North Carolina. Rudolph wants to know, how is it possible that there's no skull fracture or brain trauma in Kathleen Peterson when 257 other blunt force trauma cases have one or the other or both? She doesn't have an answer for that. Yeah. Uh. This is the way he challenged her conclusion that this was a homicide. 